surprising for you all. Now it's time for a much awaited first panel discussion, the scientific fist of the day. The theme of this session, bridging the gap, nurse interventions to mitigate the diagnostic errors in healthcare setting. Without further ado, I'd like to invite a respected Dr. Jadav Sunali Tarachan, who will be the moderator of our first panel discussion. Over to you, ma'am. A very good morning to all the audience. I hope everybody is settled. Can we have silence, please? Everybody, please settle down. Yes. So good morning to all once again. And welcome to the first track of this um, conference, the panel discussion that we are going to have on bridging the gap, the nurse interventions to mitigate diagnostic errors in healthcare settings. When we talk about diagnostic uh, errors, we probably have thoughts coming to our mind that diagnosis is a job of a medical doctor. And how do nurses come in uh, picture to prevent the diagnostic uh, errors? But when we look at it closely, we will certainly understand that making a diagnosis is putting the jigsaw uh, puzzles of information together. When you make a diagnosis, you actually have pieces of information that come from laboratory, that come from patient, that come from other healthcare team members, and doctor actually puts these pieces together. Where do nurses come and picture in diagnostic errors there? Majority of these pieces of information are brought in by nurses, if we recognize it closely. So we are actually at the heart of uh, you know, getting a right diagnosis uh, of the patient, enabling in a way a doctor to arrive at a right diagnosis of a patient. And that's why we thought that this track was very important uh, for this conference. So we have a, a galaxy of uh, experienced and expert panelists who will help us understand as to how nurses can help prevent diagnostic errors. Uh, I would like to invite them on the dais uh, for the panel discussion. Uh, uh, may I first uh, call upon Mr. Ms. Margaret Roy Gavrinath. Uh, please welcome on the dais. Margaret is working as a consultant in nursing and healthcare uh, quality. Uh, she has an uh, illustrious career uh, ranging over the last 30 years one of the most senior persons, we must say. Uh, she uh, currently, she, her previous positions are like, she's worked as operations management, uh, she's consultant and faculty, she's worked in uh, healthcare. Uh, she, has, she has also been working as a head of nursing. And in beginning of her career, a place where probably a lot of errors tend to happen, uh, she's also worked as a critical care nurse. Uh, where I think patient safety is very important. She also has some experience in ward management. Uh, so uh, it's a pleasure to have you, Margaret. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, may I now call upon our next panelist, uh, uh, Ms. Lima Matthews. Uh, Lima Matthews is working as a nursing superintendent at Ramaya uh, uh, Medical College Hospital, which is a 600-bedded uh, hospital, which is accredited by NABH. Uh, Lima, uh, I must say that what I know her for the last uh, couple of years that she's been working with us uh, is the most energetic and a dynamic nursing leader uh, who's very passionate about uh, patient care, patient safety, and also she's the voice of nurses. 
Uh, you know, she cares for uh, whether the nurses get their dues. Lima has worked in her past as a staff nurse. She has also worked in education sector for some time. Uh, she's also been a nurse educator in the hospitals and many corporate hospitals. She's been a nursing superintendent and as you can see on screen, she's also received several awards in the past. Welcome, Lima. I would like to invite the next panelist, uh, Mrs. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sumake. Please uh, welcome to the dais, uh, Colonel Suma. Uh, Colonel Suma is another very senior person uh, whose, uh, whose career started with Army experience. Uh, currently, she works as a general manager uh, of nursing at Apollo Hospitals, Bangalore. Uh, previously, she has been the chief manager of nursing at Manipal Hospital and has, as I said, she has served a long uh, time of her career, 21 years in Army Nursing Services. Uh, she is going to be the great asset for this panel. Uh, welcome, Suma. Uh, our next, uh, the last but the not uh, least panelist for this session, we have the youngest girl uh, who is a panelist here, uh, Ms. Jasmine Bano. Uh, Jasmine is probably the first nurse practitioner. She is currently working as the nurse practitioner at Sparsh Hospitals, Bangalore. Uh, she uh, gets involved. Uh, uh, she, I have interviewed her recently as part of my research project, and I understood uh, from her talk that she is on a doctor's rotation uh, prepared in Sparsh Hospital. Uh, as a duty rotation where she goes to critical care uh, unit and she actually independently uh, assesses patients. Uh, she is enabled at Spurge hospitals to make decisions with regards to uh, patient treatment even, uh, diagnostic uh, procedures that they want to carry on. Uh, she is highly skilled at um, invasive procedures like uh, initiating uh, uh, central venous line, uh, doing endotracheal intubations, performing a tracheostomy, uh, and she's doing it on a daily basis at Spurge Hospitals. Uh, she's going to be, again, a great asset for us to get insights as to how nurses can improve diagnostic errors. So welcome, Jasmine. Uh, so we have all the panelists here. Let us begin with our discussion. My first question for this panel discussion will be to uh, Ms. Margaret Gaurinath. Uh, as we talked, I think, when we look at the international patient safety goals, uh, one of the first goals it uh, talks about is effective communication. And as nurses, all of us understand that how important communication is in hospital, how important it is for nurses while they deliver care. And I'm sure it is very important for avoiding diagnostic errors. Uh, so, Margaret, we would like to know from you as to how communication, uh, effective communication can be implemented at the hospitals or taught to the nurses that can actually prevent diagnostic errors. Please give us some insights. Thank you, Dr. Sonali, for this question. Uh, like you rightly said when you introduced this uh, topic, that nurses are in the middle of the uh, interdisciplinary team, including the doctors, where uh, everybody has to arrive, the doctors have to arrive to a diagnosis. So when nurses are in the middle, how do nurses put this thing into action is by effective communication. We have learned in our uh, nursing schools uh, the, in the fundamental of nursing uh, about assessment, uh, assessment at the bedside, assessment, uh, you know, directly and indirectly. So how do this assessment comes into practice is the key is communication. Now this communication is both, uh, you know, uh, verbal communication as well as verbal non-verbal communication. We have had lot of communication training and thanks to all the organizations including Annie and many other, uh, you know, in their own organization level also, I think uh, the leaders must 
conduct a lot of uh, training programs on effective communication. Effective communication teaches uh, the nurse or empowers her to become more and more confident in uh, you know, delivering her communication uh, tactics and mechanism at the bedside. Uh, the nurse has to understand that she is the only person who can, uh, you know, through her communication, bring all the pieces of the jigsaw like you mentioned. Uh, she has to talk to the patient, she has to talk to all the members involved in the interdisciplinary committee and bring the pieces to a central area where the communication is co uh, collated and shared for further arriving to a diagnosis without any error. While communicating, like the, the non-verbal uh, you know, communication which the nurse does, uh, an example, when the nurse is communicating to a patient, when she is doing an assessment, she uh, should ensure that whatever she's going to say, that contains a lot of weightage, that impression the patient should get. So going to the bedside, standing with him, and not putting uh, you know, um, a, a figure which seems to be that she's in a hurry. So relax, she stay, stands there, teaches the pre-procedure instruction, gives the pre uh, post-procedure instructions to the patient so that she also receives the patient's anxiety. So empowering oneself by taking training on effective communication, how communication has to be delivered. And uh, another thing is also when we are communicating with the patient, we should use teach-back techniques. Teach-back techniques is when we talk to the patients, uh, whatever we have communicated to ensure that they have understood that very well to ensure that their anxiety has been allayed, to ensure that they have understood and to gain their cooperation. I think it is very important that um, a teach back uh, technique must be adopted. That is the patient replies back what you have told to ensure that he has understood what you want to tell the patient. And when we are communicating to other departments where, who are involved in the diagnosis, we must also tell them uh, a little bit background about the patient about the past as well as the current, what has happened to the patient or what is happening to the patient. So collating all this information is very important uh, uh, and to share it to the right person at the right time is also very important. A very small example, uh, communication has to go to, uh, you know, the, the grassroot kind of a thing. When we talk to the patient and we've asked whether he has passed motion, Asking the color of the stool will also aid in a kind of assisting in coming to a diagnosis. A patient who has got you know, pain in abdomen, the color of the stool will also play an effective role in, you know, in helping the uh, healthcare provider coming to a conclusion uh, or coming to a kind of a diagnosis. A patient who has come to ER, the ER and the primary care settings are the area especially where uh, you know, a lot of errors happen and uh, you know we are all time constrained in these areas so in these areas our communication with the patient uh, helps to gather a lot of information an rta female who has come with you know fracture of the limb uh, must have undergone uh, an mtp or a missed abortion a few days back that information also is very vital because that will be a secondary uh, you know, uh, diagnosis or it may, uh, you know, contribute or it may lead to the primary diagnosis. So I think effective communication by the nurses is very important. Effective communication, uh, you know, skill uh, does not come in one day. We have to keep nurturing it in ourselves and not leave any opportunity of communication training, you know, uh, get missed. We must uh, keep ourselves in the uh, learning mode and uh, become more and more confident by becoming effective communicators. I Thanks, hope that Margaret, for uh, those insights. I think as Margaret was talking, uh, we could hear her talk about uh, observation skills. She talked about whether you observe the stool color. So that brings us to the part of assessment that the nurses uh, do on your, their patients on a daily basis as they talk to them or as they observe them or probably as they perform a full-fledged uh, physical assessment on them. So Jasmine, you are working as a uh, nurse practitioner and uh, your forte is actually patient assessment. I think the curriculum that you learn uh, gave a lot of importance in patient assessment because having, without having those pieces in place, 
uh, it's very hard to reach to conclusion as to uh, what can be, what really needs to be done for patient. So how can we, uh, uh, how can the patient assessment errors be avoided so that the diagnostic errors can be minimized and what nurses could do about it? I think am I yes. am audible? Okay. Uh, so, well, ma'am, in my perspective, it is kind of a little different, but mm. if you want me to put those perspectives, then uh, definitely I would take a very uh, quick initiation when the patient arrives in my area, critical care area usually. So I'll just go immediately start assessing the patient. So as ma'am says, communication is definitely the first key. But before that, sometimes when we are assessing about uh, diagnostic errors when we are talking about diagnostic errors so we have to know the definition of error so we should be very carefully assessing the patient and uh, evaluating the patient and evaluating the needs of the patient that uh, particular thing will definitely help us a lot and being a nurse practitioner if you ask me uh, ma'am I think I'll definitely evaluate in a very well manner, I say, though I don't have a much experience, but I would say um, I mean, I'm well uh, knowledgeable enough to assess the patient. Uh, so I have seen a lot of people, a lot of uh, my co-workers, a lot of nurses in the critical care area and other areas also in the hospital. They have studied enough, they are very well educated, they have a lots of knowledge about it, but one thing is there is something lacking with the confidence. So I feel confidence is also a very important thing uh, to assess the patient, which is again, it can prevent a diagnostic error over there. And uh, uh, definitely one is the communication, second is the assessment part, and uh, third one is, I would say, a critical thinking also is an important aspect, I feel. Uh, because when there is no critical thinking, a patient will come with, as ma'am said, it is abdominal pain. Definitely, I would uh, rather give another example where uh, I would say patient will come with a chest burning or maybe a vomiting. And the, if we know symptoms, we know what is the symptoms are showing enough to diagnose the patient, somewhere we miss it. We say it is a gastritis and we give medication then most of the times we f we find the patient is having myocardial infarction so that is where we are losing some bridge over there to communicate maybe to take a proper history or maybe to diagnose in a proper symptomatic way so this one thing we should avoid we all nurses should avoid so you're trying to say that when pieces of uh symptoms you get to know sometimes we as nurses fail to weave those symptoms together and understand the whole picture that probably the patient has a burning sensation in the chest and a vomiting he has had and uh, uneasy feeling in the epigastrium and this could be uh, probably an mi uh, that critical thinking uh, probably doesn't come should out be there. yeah should be yeah there. So I think, yeah, that's a great insight. I just remember one example from my experience uh, when I was uh, working in St. John's, um, uh, one of the um, ITUs, we had these uh, intensive therapy units and uh, uh, nurses made uh, assessment of central venous pressure and uh, it came as um, very high. Uh, then the PG doctor came and she said this patient's uh, CVP can't be so high, uh, you know. And when she looked at it carefully, it was uh, found out that the scale that was fixed on the IV pole to assess the uh, central venous pressure was not fixed correctly at a zero point. Uh, so uh, provided uh, that we considered this reading as a high reading and gave some medication because all doctor's decisions would be based on nurses' assessments. Uh, the patient would be in danger. Uh, so I think uh, that is what uh, just appeared to my mind uh, for sharing. So uh, going next, I think uh, involving patient, there's a lot of talk today about how we can involve patients into their own care. Uh, because when we involve patients, and also probably sometimes their attenders, 
uh, we can they they know what is happening and probably they could also be one of the stakeholders who give us feedback as to whether things that are happening to them are going right or no so having patients involving patient care requires the patients to be educated and coming to you colonel suma uh, we would like to know from you as to how patient education by nurses can uh, be helpful in uh, improving diagnostic errors at hospitals. Thank you, Dr. Sonali. Yeah. Um, uh, patient education, what we say, it is uh, information, uh, education, and communication. We say all three activities. First is very important that we inform patient as to what is going on with them. It's uh, gone out those days because we need to empower the patient and the families so that they can take uh, proper decisions because it deals with their lives. So that is very important. So as a nurse, whatever procedure that we are doing it for the patient, it, they have to be informed about it. There's no second way about it. So the first thing that we do is like how the other people have said, information also says it starts from right when the patient comes to you. Though there are times when the doctors have done a thorough assessment and have them, there are always some slips and gaps which can be filled by nurses, by meticulous history taking and an assessment. Smaller things can be left. Like I just give, wanted to give you a scenario um, which happened uh, quite some time back, which was shared by one of my colleagues. So um, the colleague's mother was admitted in the hospital. Um, uh, so the colleague's mother was uh, feeling breathless and um, she was also, her abdomen was also distended. So the doctor came and told her, uh, saw the patient uh, and said the patient has to be shifted to ICU because the patient is breathless and I may have to put the patient on a, a non-invasive ventilation because uh, definitely the uh, SpO2 is gone down. When my the colleague, who also happened to be a nurse, saw her mother, she found that the mother had, you know, slipped off. Though she had put the patient in a faultless position, she had slipped down and her neck was touching it and she was feeling very awkward in that position. So she just requested doctor, just hold on. Let me reposition my mother. She repositioned her mother and then um, that also helped. Her saturation became absolutely fine and uh, nothing had happened to her and then uh, she prevented her mother from being shifted to so observation and appropriate action at the time, a critical thinking ability of the nurse and as well as proper education to the patient. Say, for example, when we do a procedure, before a procedure, say, for example, a blood collection has to be done for a patient, sample collection. So the nurse goes and says that I am going to take blood sample for all these particular tests. So if you inform, probably the patients would have got the same test done some time back, just a day before or a two day before. And we need not repeat the same uh, sample again, which the doctor would have failed to even ask. And unnecessarily, if we without uh, even informing them, you collect the sample and when the response come, that definitely irritates the patient and they lose trust in the hospital, thinking that you know the, patient, the hospital is there to make money. Already these tests have been done and nobody told us. So that is why we ended up making, doing the test again and the hospital is making money. So the trust factor goes away. So it's important that we explain the patient that this test has to be done. And if it's already done, the nurse can confirm it with the doctor whether those tests needs to be repeated or not. So this is a smaller example which definitely feels. Secondly, before giving any medications, also it is very important that we uh, uh, tell the patient that what medications are we giving and uh, what is the action of the medication. We may not use medical jargons, but a simple action, it is an antibiotic or, you know, it is an antihypertensive or an anti uh, oral hypoglycemic agent, what it is given. Sometimes the doctor would have prescribed 
two, three antihypertensives, and which may, you know, which need not be given at the same time. If you give three, or two to three anti antihypertensives at the same time, it will definitely cause a problem. Or there have been instances where the patient is not a diabetic and an oral hypoglycemic agent has been advised. So these are things which we have to involve the patient as well as the patient's uh, party. And moreover, when we are informing, we also have to understand, we have to know the cognitive level of the patient. Because the patient who cannot understand, so just talking to him or telling something will be very difficult. And whenever we do a procedure, first do an identification because similar name of the patients may be there. And then that also may cause sometimes errors in treatment, errors in diagnosis. We have patients with the same name or a long label is pasted, don't have done, not have done the patient identification. And the patient has been, a wrong procedure has been done for a patient. It could be a surgery, it could be a diagnostic procedure. So that causes definitely and later the patient says, I don't have these symptoms at all. Because nobody in that, you know, no, none of them, right, starting from the consultant to the nurse, nobody has even, you know, spoken to the patient or done a proper history taking, which becomes very difficult in that case. So we need to know the cognitive level of the person, the language that we are speaking, what language are we speaking and what patient is speaking. If there is a difference in the language, so whatever you educate will be down the drain. So we also have to understand that. And thirdly, uh, we have to ask the patient to repeat back, like how the previous speaker has said, to understand whether the patient understood what you have said. So that is very important. And in case we, the patient is not able to follow you, either have the attendant who can, you know, who can, or a translator who can speak to the patient. So these are very important for us. And also the discharge, at the time of discharge, what education the patient has to be given. And if there are any procedures that we expect the patient or the attendant to do at home, we will have to demonstrate it and get a written demonstration done from them so that they have understood and they follow it perfectly. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Suma. That was very interesting listening to you. Uh, I totally agree with your point of, uh, you know, making sure that you talk to the patient in a language that the patient truly understands and uh, uh, getting a feedback from the patient whether he's understood is a key important thing because I have seen in my bedside work when I worked as a staff nurse a lot of patients, especially on a uh, OPD basis when they are given instructions to come for diagnostic tests such as giving a lipid profile sample early in the morning or giving a faster fasting blood sugar sample in the morning they truly don't understand what is fasting you know they may uh, eat something they may f think that it might take a longer time and they eat a small meal and they come for a test and they don't understand this eating a small meal what they thought could have a larger impact on the test results whether it's a lipid profile, whether it's a uh, diabetic uh, patient's blood sugar. So I think it's very important. A test as simple as uh, getting a midstream urine sample sometimes, uh, you know, uh, for uh, culture and sensitivity from patients. We fail to give uh, instructions to patients as to what is a midstream sample, how should they collect it. Most of the times they're just given a dabba and sent to the washroom. And they collect as they want, and probably if, uh, if there are some germs, we may erroneously catch it as an infection. So I think uh, those things are very, very important. I've seen errors happening even 24 hours urine collection, you know, when to begin, when to end. Uh, so I think those are the points we should keep in mind. Uh, they are truly, even simple maintenance of IO charts. Uh, what is the total intake? What is the total output? And these figures are going to determine whether or not certain medications will be started for a patient by a uh, doctor. So I think these are the areas that nurses truly need to uh, pay attention and they can prevent diagnostic One errors. One more thing I just wanted to yes, add. Yes, please. So when you said about yeah. it. Uh -huh. So I remember the nurse telling the patient that, okay, uh, don't eat anything. Mm. So the patient had the next day, the morning, the patient had coffee. Yeah. So when we asked, we told me not, she said not to eat anything. I drank. But she did not say what, yeah. not to drink yeah. anything. So <laughs> I had coffee. <laughs> right. So I think these are the points for us to learn from it that you should not eat or drink anything probably except sips of water. 
this should be the very clear and uh, clear cut instruction that one must give to your uh, patients. That's a learning point from here for us. Moving further, uh, coming back to you, Jasmine, once again. Uh, as we say that sometimes we fail to give instruction to patients, sometimes we as nurses fail to understand as to certain medications when we administer to a patient before performing certain diagnostic tests uh, could alter the results of the test. Uh, so how uh, uh, would you like to give some insights to the audience as to how uh, administration of medications can hinder uh, with uh, arriving at a right diagnosis and how can nurses prevent uh, these kind of errors? Uh, well, ma'am, so what we could do is first here, like there is a proper communication should be there. People, I mean we, all of us, we should ask the patient uh, the, the symptoms whatever he is having. For example, now patient will say as I only gave the example of chest burning. So we will recognize it is an gastritis and we will inform the doctors that the patient is having so and so symptoms. Most of the times doctors are occupied with a lot of other works. So what they'll do is they'll rely on trustable nurses. And it usually happens in the uh, uh, practicing areas, right? So what we have to do is we have to assess them properly and give the proper clear instructions to the doctors so that they should not give a wrong medications. They should not order a wrong medications at the time. So it's a communication. So if we tell them a proper symptoms, whatever the patient is having, so they'll come and assess if it is the assessment is not enough though from the nurses, right? And uh, the second thing is, ma'am, the measures if you ask me about. So I would say it's, a, it's all about review and a feedback and a communication. And I was going through one article, uh, so I usually sit and read some critical care journals. So there is one journal called, uh, it's an uh, American critical care journal, it's a journal of uh, medicine. So there one person has written, question is the answer, sometimes. So if you ask, okay, what medicines have you taken? So patient will say whatever. If patient doesn't know, some patients will come without any information and knowledge. So at least nowadays I'm seeing, I communicate with a lot of patients. So a lot of patients comes with the slip in their hand. So madam, this is what we have taken. So that is also one point to be considered that we should have a very clear uh, view on it, whatever the patient has been taken. So that one thing we could do to avoid any medication errors and feedback. So now for gastritis, we have given a pantoprazole. Think just PPI works. So PPI after PPI, we forget because just doctors orders the PPIs, we will give and administrate, administer the medication. And after that, we will forget to go and ask the patient, are you feeling better? Most of the time this happened and I have seen it. And consider me also being a very uh, young person in the field, I have done this mistakes also. So I think we learn from our mistake, we should go and take a feedback from the patient as well, that how are you feeling? That one word definitely give us a lot of information, I feel so. Okay. And also, ma'am, uh, the, uh, the question is the answer, that's what the journal one point. So question is the answer, definitely ask them, they'll tell you. If they don't know, they'll give you the information in other way. So taking that information. So another few points what I need to add is accuracy and timeliness. So in view of avoiding a medication error, accuracy as in like inaccuracy is, is a definitely obvious. So most of the time complaints are something and we are diagnosing with something. So this is happening since very long time. I think we should avoid uh, this thing. And uh, to avoid the inaccuracy, uh, there should be a proper, uh, again, uh, the communication and the medications. So see, check the medication. So five hours, we have been, uh, we have been learning since our like birth in the nursing, I could say. So yeah, five hours. I think everybody know what is five hours. Right? I don't get any answers. Yes, definitely. So that is one thing and timeliness also. We can't give a false hopes to patients saying that because if the patient comes with the complaints of, I mean, it's just a common complaints, 
but think that is going to be a cancer. So we can't say we can't diagnose cancer within one day. So we need that time. So clear explanation to the patient and the family also helps us a lot to avoid these errors. Any other panelists who would like to add any insights on how medications could interfere with diagnostic errors? Yes, Lima. Is it working? Pass this. Yeah. So as Jasmine told, uh, what I feel is for the, there should be more engagement of patients and patients bystanders in identifying a disease at the early stage. For example, if we say a patient bystander or a patient who knows to do a breast self-examination to the best way would be able to identify it at the earliest. And then they can bring it and alert the healthcare team on that. So patients as well as bystanders should be involved in the daily care of the hospital. So uh, what I feel, hospitals can have many strategies to involve the bystanders into their care when they are on admission itself. So I can share an example what we have done last week as a part of patient safety program. Our nurses, they were being given some topics to educate the patient about the care. For example, like usual our areas are like pressure ulcer, medication safety as she have told. So we try to involve our admitted patients our bystanders into each counters where we made them to explain the same thing to the other bystanders. So uh, as we all know, teaching is the best method of learning because there is a lot of communication barriers. What we taught and what they understand, finally what they follow is different that we face in our everyday life. So we have to ensure that patients or bystanders are reciprocating what we, are what we have taught them. So th if that can be ensured in some ways like involving our fellow patients and bystanders into our daily education aspects. Ours is a medical college hospital. Why I am sorting our example, that is the best thing which I can explain to you. We have common wards. So we do a mass education in the ward. So we try to put a patient bystander also. He will explain or she will explain what is expected out from the bystanders in the treatment as well as in the early identification of complication. Especially for patients who are coming for repeated patients like chemotherapy. So this is one thing which I would like to, we have to ensure whether, whether our patients are able to reciproc reciprocate the thing or the content what we taught them. That can be ensured. I think yeah. it can yeah, yeah. make our things that's, much easier. That's a great example from our hospital, Lima. Uh, I'm sure people are going to appreciate that learning. Uh, since I just would like to add, uh, since we are talking about the medication safety, I mean medication administration and uh, diagnostic uh, error prevention, uh, one of the common things that I have come across in the hospitals is there may be on admission there are certain uh, instructions written by doctors for nurses, uh, say, uh, give a first shot of uh, antibiotic XYZ, uh, then there would be another order that send sample for blood culture. And then comes the wisdom of a nurse as to whether the sample should be drawn first or the antibiotic shot should be given first. Uh, now, if you give an antibiotic shot first and then you draw a sample, certainly you are not going to find a microbe in the um, blood, right? So that's where comes our role into diagnostic safety that you must understand as to what this investigation is meant for. It is meant for capturing the uh, bacteria or whatever organism that's there in the blood that's causing the disease for the patient and probably even if there's an order for medication. So in what order should we carry out our task? I think that's where comes the uh, nurse's wisdom. Uh, now that the Lima was talking about uh, how uh, hospital in her hospital uh, that they have, they are engaging patients. So I think uh, that brings us to the part of policies of hospital as to uh, how they want to engage nurses basically into 
you know, preventing diagnostic errors in their own hospitals. So apart, you already have spoken about the patient education lima. Would you like to share any other insights that how uh, hospitals could uh, engage nurses and um, prevent diagnostic errors? As always, we say, thank you for the question. Empowerment means it has to come from inside. So first thing is, we should be aware about our role. As nurses, we are very important and we are actively participating in identifying the errors, identifying the disease condition or a health problem. So this is bi-directional. Nurses should be aware about the role as well as our fellow partners, clinicians, should be giving that autonomy and should be uh, acknowledging our contributions in identification or contributing towards a diagnosis of a disease condition. So that is the first thing as healthcare leaders or in the hospitals have to bring a culture of working together and rather than physician oriented, it should be patient oriented. Final outcome is we are trying to make a right diagnosis without any delay. So for that, we need the inputs from everyone. It includes the entire healthcare team members, especially doctors and nurses. So what I feel, we have to remove the operational barriers in the hospitals. So that is, again, a cultural change where we can have our interprofessional team meetings, team rounds, where the doctors and nurses sit together or they have a common clinical language. Because nurses, we usually, usually say is that nursing, I've heard people speaking, nursing diagnosis is different. Medical diagnosis is different. It's no way related. It's not like that. Our nurses' diagnosis is resulting towards a clinical diagnosis. So that role awareness should be first within us. Then we can work on towards that. For that, hospitals should have this encourage doctors, nurses meets. They should work together. Rather than conducting CNEs only with the nurses, let us have case scenarios discussion in our hospital where our doctors, nurses sit together, discuss about a clinical scenario, what we could have done be well before, whether we have become a little bit delayed in diagnosing the case, what may be the reasons, can we, can we uh, uh, re find out which are the ways where we can improve. So such type of meetings and such type of education can give an empowerment for our nurses, as well as they feel confidence. She was talking about the confidence. Con it's like a circle. It's like a process. It never comes with words. We have to act onto that. If a second person who is near to me acknowledge my effort, automatically I will feel proud. See, when Madam was praising me, I was feeling so happy. <laughs> Everybody is like that. Human beings are like that, right? Because we like to be appreciated. We like to be motivated. That is what we. Uh, what, which keep us always active and keep us on the track. So that type of motivations and appreciations are required in the hospital because our fellow nurses are already a partner in the diagnosis. We have many examples. In emergency department, if we see triage nurse, she is the first person who categorizes the criticality of the patient. Nobody else. She only will direct the doctor. She is in the red zone. Let's act first on to the red zone. So she is an active partner, but most of the time, we pull ourselves down. In, in, in an ICU setup, if we take ventilator patient, or some patients who is critical, where we identify the arrhythmias at the early stage, she only will alert the clinician or the intensivist, where she is actively participating in the identification of a health problem. In a labor room, we identify the decelerations first for an NST, yes, yes. So we are active partners. Only thing we ourselves has to be aware, show your confidence so that doctors or the clinicians will also feel to give, take you to that level. And of course, their corporations are very important. And nowadays, hospitals are encouraging many specialty courses. But uh, in India, I, I have a doubt, we had a discussion also before, whether our specialty nurses are recognized to that level or whether we have given that autonomy and the opportunity to practice to the level of what they have learned. So that has to be overlooked, I feel. Nowadays, more nursing leaders like Ajita Madam, Thang uh, Thangam Madam, all are coming, they are like heading the institutions. So such steps always keep us encouraged because hoping that we will be having nurses into many roles. So that opportunity and platform is very important. 
and uh, of course your policy protocol of the hospital like there can be a proper structured algorithms which helps the doctor and nurse to identify the case but ultimately it should not be like an individual work it should be a collaborative work so first and foremost is to have doctors nurses sitting together can we have such sessions regularly sitting together discussing case scenarios where nurse is being an given an opportunity where she is recognized for what her for her recommendations what she make that is truly important for a hospital and uh, uh, as madam told we have already discussed regarding patient engagement nurses can be involved into those roles like nurse practitioners are there nurse midwife programs are there uh, i think in corporate hospitals we have many periphery hospitals at just this point i will conclude uh, periphery hospitals are there so usually we will be having a cmo working there why can't we think about a nurse practitioner or a, uh, a nurse led clinic where she can be the first level responder for the health problem she can refer the cases to the tertiary health care so these if we have passionate nurses if we give us the confidence by ourselves we can come forward and hospitals can give many opportunities of course it's always a war within ourselves we have to prove ourselves in front of the management and the other health leaders to come forward thanks lima for those great insights i think the major takeaway points that lima gave us that uh, all healthcare personnel the hospital must learn to treat them equitably and respect them in a equitable manner second should have some protocols uh, to be followed collaboratively between the nurses and the doctors probably third i would say that she brought out a very important point that doctors and nurses must sit in one classroom and have an interdisciplinary learning uh, and probably these are all going to take us uh, a long way uh, in we uh, in a true sense working like a team Uh, to prevent diagnostic errors and to ensure patient safety at the hospital uh, and i think i would like to appreciate the point what lima said also that why at a satellite center only a cmo sits i would get, go a step further this thought has been there in my mind for long that uh, all of you must be knowing i think a couple of years ago the karnataka government launched the nama clinics and every second day you open a newspaper there is a news that nama clinics are not doing good because there is no enough doctors the purpose of nama clinics is ncd prevention non communicable disease prevention what is happening at nama clinics is only the care of diabetic patients and care of hypertensive patients and screening for most common cancers i personally believe that this is truly can be done by nurses and i think at, i have a say to government of karnataka that probably you don't need a doctor at nama clinics you need a nurse practitioner who can handle uh, screening of ncds and uh, you know she'll come at a cheaper cost than what you are spending on doctors because again karnataka government i guess doesn't have enough money as a now to spend uh, so we are <laughs> we we come cheaper we are better the only thing you're not giving us are uh, dues you know where you're not engaging you have the resource you're not utilizing it well uh, so thanks for that uh, lima uh, finally uh, in the interest of time we have coming to a final question and i would like you to be brief uh, margaret that uh, we would like to know from you this this is a era of digitalization and technology so how can the uh, technology and digitalization help us uh, minimize diagnostic errors that probably nurses contribute to thank you dr sonali uh, i would like to speak more on nursing related uh, digitalization and technology now necessity is the mother of invention and this necessity came from the biggest challenge in nursing that is shortage of nursing workforce and uh, increased work load uh, increased errors medical errors and also uh, lack of patient outcomes now because of all this a uh, lot of technological advancement has happened uh, and uh, digitalization is happening Digitali digitalization has led to a lot of uh, you know reduction in our paperwork which was a very you know big load for nursing though i would say it is not completely reduced in all the areas corporate hospitals and Uh, private hospitals who understand the benefits of this uh, they have adopted digitalization and they are promoting it but not uh, in all kind of uh, you know hospitals we don't have digitalization at 
uh, as yet. But wherever it has, it has proved that digitalization has uh, brought in a lot of advantages where the nursing workload also has reduced because of which she has devoted more into uh, you know, effective patient care uh, and the patient outcomes have become better. Um, technology wise, uh, I think, uh, again, I would go back that digitalization and technology, both when they are coming, nurses have to again upgrade themselves and uh, you know, hone their skills, upgrade their skills to become competent to use that digital and the technology which is uh, you know, available at her workstation or in her work area. So um, wherever she is studying, there she must have an opportunity to be exposed to technology, uh, be exposed to, uh, you know, having a hands-on experience on working on various softwares. So when she is going for practical areas, she must get an opportunity to work on the digital platform uh, to have an experience uh, that how digitalization can bring a benefit to uh, her patient care. Um, uh, when it comes to reducing the uh, workload with the help of technology, um, you know, every day thanks that there is upgradation in nursing technology. We have seen from uh, having a digital BP apparatus to a robot, you know, that is the level that we have gone. Uh, but still we need, uh, I think nurses are the only one who can tell that what technological assistance we want, uh, where that is going to be our assistant and not going to be superior to our work. Like, the technology cannot overpower us. We have to use technology as an assistant. The technology should not use nurses as an assistant because that will lead to medical errors and uh, a big threat to, uh, you know, patient safety for which we are sitting today. Um, uh, the nurses should be trained to use the digital platform and to do use technology in a way where it is safe for all the stakeholders. Now, um, I have seen when to all of nursing leaders will agree there's a lot of companies coming every day at least one person comes and asks us that madam what are the challenges you are facing in the work area tell us we will help you we will you know uh, create a device or we will give us your inputs we are planning to create a device we need your inputs so that itself says that we are the core people who can advise them on what technological advancement uh, or assistance that we want now uh, having uh, said that we have to uh, you know tell um, yes time <laughs> yes i think we need to keep up with okay. the time okay. yeah. i will i yeah. will wind yeah. up yeah. that yeah. Uh, mm. you know um, uh, technology is there for us mm. for example we have a stethoscope which has an inbuilt saturation as well as an ecg machine now the nurses should know how to use it now the uh, there are hospitals who have technology who want to introduce technology but they are afraid because it is cost it is uh, you know um, very expensive now to make it cost effective the nurses have to contribute by uh, uh, keeping this in mind that they should not uh, you know waste these technological resources by creating harm to the patient as well as practically losing the uh, you know the, the cost of the technology for example uh, um, you know a vein finder yeah. it is an expensive thing uh, when that is, uh, you know, distributed in the wards, many times either it doesn't work or it is lost. So the, what the management says that we are not going to give you any vein finder because you people lose it. So technology, using technology to the best of our, uh, you know, ease of work and best yeah. patient outcome is what we should keep in mind. And nursing leaders have a very big role in, uh, you know, introducing digitalization and technology to our own nurses in a way right. that it is a win-win situation for all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Margaret, for those great insights into how technology can be used to minimize diagnostic errors. Uh, do we have time for a couple of questions from the audience before we close? Uh, no, I'm getting a signal that we don't have time for the uh, questions from the audience, although we would have loved to take them. 
Uh, but I encourage the audience to kindly meet the panelists at the lunch breaks and have a uh, over the lunch conversation to if they had any questions for the panelists to uh, talk to them and uh, get answers from them. Uh, so thank you. Uh, to summarize today's panel, uh, we have had a fantastic uh, panel of uh, speakers who have given us insights as to how communication is important, uh, how uh, assessment errors can be prevented uh, to, uh, uh, to ensure that there is a correct diagnosis that happens for the patient, how our medication administrations can interfere with the diagnosis of the patient in a right manner. We have also discussed about how technologies can help us, digitalization can help us prevent human errors that we commit when we communicate either in oral or in writing in a hospital with regard to patient-related information. And finally, we have also looked at what are the policies and procedures that the hospitals need to adopt to engage nurses to minimize the uh, diagnostic errors through nurses. Uh, so once again, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, it was great having you. Yes, good day. Thank you, ma'am, for moderating this session. And thank you to all the panelists for the thoughtful and insightful discussion. Thank you to everyone once again.